have no right to be ordinary. God has called you to be extraordinary. Liberty, jump up to your feet. Come on, put your hands together like this.
I won't be shaken, I rest in God and God alone. I rest in God and God alone. My only hope, the cornerstone to every trial or fire. in battle, the humble by my every need, well it's by strength, but not my own, well I rest in God, and God alone, well, I That's a great message for all of us, resting in God alone. Because there are times in life when that's all we've got left, when that's all that there is, is to rest in the hands of an almighty God who loves us. And there is a family in our Liberty community that right now they need our prayers and they need to experience what it's like to rest in the hands of God. And so many of you have heard that one of our students here at Liberty, Walter Scott II, he passed away a couple of days ago, tragically been sick for a long time. This family's been through so much. Back in 2015, his dad was tragically killed down in Charleston, South Carolina. And now Walter II has passed away. And so this coming Tuesday over at Hill City Church with Pastor James Hobson here in Lynchburg, there's going to be a memorial service for Walter. It's going to be at 7 o'clock. And we encourage you, if you, if you knew Walter and he was part of our LU Praise ministry, part of our worship 
uh, school there. Incredible, incredible young man. And so if you happen to know him or have some connection there, we encourage you to go out and to minister to that family so that they can know like the Liberty family is coming alongside, kind of wrapping our arms and our hearts around each and every one of them. His mom is going to be here for the service, and so we, we certainly want to be praying for them. So let's just pray right now that God would speak peace and comfort and encouragement into the life of this family. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the fact that no matter what it is that we are experiencing, God, that you are good. God, that your mercies are new every single day. And God, I know that for this family, for the Scott family, like they need to know that today in a way they've never known before. They need to experience your perfect peace, that Philippians 4, the peace that doesn't make sense. God, the tragedies that they've experienced as a family, the heartache that they've been through. And God, through it all, I know this, I, I know that you still care, that you still love them, and God, that you will do for them what they desperately need. But it's in those moments when our hearts are broken that oftentimes the, the situation and the circumstance can cloud our understanding of who you are. And so God, I just pray that you would Lord, open that family's eyes to who you are. Let them see you working in their lives. God, let them continue to rest in that perfect peace that comes only from you. And God, for that, we will give you the praise. God, we pray that even in Walter's short life, God, that you would use his testimony and his witness and that it would continue to be a ministry, not only to the students here at Liberty, but in so many others that had the opportunity of knowing him and hearing about him and hearing his heart, God, that they would be pointed towards you because today Walter is with you. And Father, for that, we also give you the praise. Lord, bless our time together today. Lord, help us to be encouraged through your word. Help us to grow in our knowledge and understanding of who you are and help us today that when we walk out of this room, that we will be closer you, to you than we were than when we walked in. And God, for that, we also, too, give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, go ahead and have a seat, guys. You know we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. We have been ministering to the Afghan refugees that are over at Fort Pickett about an hour and a half away. We've had over 100 of our students here at Liberty that have actually had the opportunity of going and being a part of those missions uh, opportunities. In fact, if you're here today and you're one of that group of students that has gone down to Fort Pickett in the last couple of weeks, why don't you just stand wherever you are right now. Stand wherever you are right now. Let's give them a big hand. We had a group we had a group that was over there yesterday ministering and we have more groups going. We have a group going tomorrow and every Saturday we're going to be going down to Fort Pickett. And so if you have not signed on yet to be a part of that, we just remind you. Uh, in fact, you can uh, text us uh, text serve now to 839-858 and uh, they'll let you know how to get connected on one of those trips. Incredible things that have happened. Uh, we've collected so many supplies. That big truck that you saw parked out of Vines uh, a couple of weeks ago has gone down with uh, an entire load of supplies for that. We're continuing to collect things, and uh, a lot of the members over Thomas Road have been bringing things in, and our students have been distributing those. They've been having the opportunity of going out and playing sports with the kids that are there. It's just really cool what God is doing. So we want you to be a part of that ministry opportunity. And so well, what I want to do right now is just share with you this morning, just by way of video, like what God has been doing at Fort Pickett when we just simply say, God, here we are, send us. So let's take a look at this video.
Good morning. I've got good news, good news. I was called this morning and told if I wanted to lift all the capacity restrictions, they would advise me to do that. So as of right now, there are no capacity restrictions here at Liberty University. We're going to get back to normal. Well, you know, I can't hear you. I don't know if you were telling me off or telling me you like it, but I couldn't hear you. But anyway, I've been rejoicing as we've come to Convo and to see what God has been doing and also how you have been responding to God's Word and God's messengers. You know, last week, we saw every space here filled with students who were coming to say, I want to become a believer in Jesus Christ. I am becoming a believer, and I want to follow the Lord Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Let's give them a big hand. And then on the next convo, man, we had a capacity number of people to come forward and say, listen, I'm a Christian, but I want to live more for the Lord and make him the Lord of my life more than I ever have. Let's give them a big hand. Now, because of what I'm seeing here and seeing your response to God's Word and God's messengers, as we're celebrating our 50th anniversary here at Liberty University, I think this could be the greatest year in the history of Liberty University. Why? Yeah, because you love the Lord. You've expressed that. I've walked around the campus, and I've seen just groups praying and reading God's Word. And I'm going to tell you what, that's what will make this year as we listen to the voice of God and as we obey the Word of God, it could be the best year in the history of Liberty University. What do you think? Now, my wife and I, we enjoy just walking around the campus and uh, meeting you as students. And uh, sometimes we'll see a student who's just sitting by themselves. And maybe they're by themselves because they've not made any connections yet. Or maybe they're just having a quiet time. We saw uh, a student, a young lady, and we walked over to her, and we saw her Bible. She had one of these Bibles that's got the wide margins on the side where you can make notes. And I looked down at the, her Bible, and I said, what are you studying? She said, I'm looking at a chapter in Psalm. And I looked at her Bible, and there was notes where she had written down notes as she listened to preachers and to speakers, and notes that she had written down as she was reading God's Word, what it meant to her. Now, she, I believe she's here today. Ashley Colin, where are you? Are you? Where are you? Help me. Where is she? Right over there. Now, Ashley... I want to invite you to come to lunch right after this convo with me and my wife, the guest speaker, and Pastor Jonathan and his wife. I want you to meet us right over here, okay? Now, some of you are going to probably say, man, I'm going to get out and get my Bible and start having a quiet time. <laughs> All right. Well, it's my joy today to introduce our guest speaker. And I'll tell you what, he's done so much, they had to give me a cue card here. All right. But by the way, before I introduce our guest speaker, some of you are wearing a ribbon to show your support that complaints of sexual abuse or sexual harassment is seriously dealt with and those who need to have consequences who have maybe sexually abused 
or done something sexually that they shouldn't, that they be treated seriously so that we can prevent sexual abuse and sexual harassment here at Liberty University. And I want you to know that I agree with you that we want to make this a safe place for all students. We want you to feel safe. We don't want any sexual harassment or sexual abuse. I don't. And I've told the department that deals with that. I said, you take every complaint seriously and you deal with it seriously. That's what I want. I think that's what you want. Well, let me get back to introducing our guest speaker, Pastor Gary Hambrick. He's senior pastor of the Cornerstone Chapel in Leesburg, Virginia. On the advisory board for the Museum of the Bible, has had opportunity to meet and pray with cabinet secretaries, Supreme Court justices, members of Congress, and the Israeli ambassador. He serves as the chief chaplain for the London County Sheriff's Office. He's an avid news junkie. He enjoys fishing, camping, playing spur sports, woodworking, umpiring high school baseball. There's something wrong here. He doesn't enjoy hunting. I'm a hunter. He doesn't enjoy hunting. Will you pray for him? Uh, <laughs> yeah. All three of his kids are alumni here. I'll let him introduce them in a moment. I'm going to ask him to do that. Let's welcome Pastor Gary here to Convo at Liberty University. Hey, buddy. Thank you for coming. Good morning, Liberty. Wow. It's so exciting to be here. I feel so honored. I feel so blessed. I feel so humbled by all of this. And to be able to speak in front of, this is what I understand, right? The largest gathering of Christian college students in the world. Wow, that's you. So I promise I won't let that go to my head because I, uh, I relate to the words of the late great Prime Minister of Great Britain, Sir Winston Churchill. Churchill was once asked, doesn't it thrill you when a crowd comes out to hear you give a speech? And Churchill said, well, it's quite flattering but every time I think of that, I'm reminded that if I were being hanged, the crowd would be t twice as big. So I'm thankful that that's not the case today. I want to acknowledge, you guys have a great team of people here. Your events team, thank you, Pastor Jonathan, thank you, Dr. Prevo, uh, Ashley, Amy, Dylan, Josh. They sent people, somebody, to Charlottesville just to get me Krispy Kreme donuts, because I have a love affair with Krispy Kreme donuts. I'm just going to confess in front of you right now. You know, if you confess, you'll be free. Krispy Kreme, it's in the Bible. I'm telling in the Message Bible. It's got to be in the Message Bible there somewhere. It's manna from heaven. I know it is. It went all the way to Charlottesville, so it is so good to be here. And my new and good friend, Dr. Ed Heinsen. I love this man, ladies and gentlemen. And you know, imitation is the highest form of flattery. And so I'm going to summarize Dr. Heinsohn's 35 plus years here at Liberty University. You ready? Jesus could come at any time <laughs> because you don't know the time. Be ready all the time before you run out of time. There you go. That's Dr. Heinsohn for you. Thank you, Dr. Heinsohn. So uh, I'm so honored to be here. Uh, two of my three children are here. Uh, my wife got sick a few days before coming here. That's all right. She, she tested negative for COVID. Don't call Dr. Fauci. Um, <laughs> what a mess. Um, but two of my three kids are here. All three of my children and one of my daughters-in-law graduated from Liberty University here. So I'm so happy to have them with me. I, so I feel like I've come home because this is where they graduated. And so it's really a privilege to be here. Now, I know that um, most of you are trying to figure out who is this guy, and that's okay because uh, I've been trying to figure out who I am, too, for most of my life. Um, but I got to be honest with you, I stumbled into ministry. I got saved at a young age, uh, and I initially denied a calling that I felt was on my life. The reason was because my uncle was a pastor, 
My grandfather was a pastor. My great-grandfather was a pastor, a circuit rider, preacher on horseback through the hills of West Virginia. And I began to think that maybe I only want to be a pastor because that's kind of what we do in our family. So my freshman year, I was at American University, my sophomore year at George Mason University as a communications major. And then at the, <laughs> communication majors, God bless you. And then, uh, and then at the end of my sophomore year, God got a hold of my heart. And I didn't hear an audible voice, but I, you know those times when God whispers to your heart and he said to me, you'll never be happy until you're serving me. And that's true for every single one of us. However God calls you in whatever capacity he calls you to, whether it's a pastor, a plumber, an athlete, an electrician, a nurse, and a business executive, a stay-at-home mom, whatever it might be, be in the center of God's will because only then will you be happiest when you're serving him in the center of his will. And uh, so when I said yes to the Lord at the end of my sophomore year, God opened the door for ministry. I was hired as a full-time youth pastor. I had no business being in ministry, but that's what happened as the Lord opened up a door. I met and married my wife all at the same time, and then I finished the last two years of my schooling online at a small Baptist college in Dothan, Alabama, because Liberty didn't have online at that time. And, uh, and then after four years of being a youth pastor, I accepted the invitation from 18 charter members to be a part of this new startup church, and I've been there ever since the last 30 years at Cornerstone Chapel. And amen, you Cornerstone people, that's right. The rest of you try to go to heaven with them. Uh, but anyway, it's been such a joy, and God has done the rest, and I give him all the glory. So greetings to you from Northern Virginia up in Leesburg. We are a suburb. We're a suburb of Washington, D.C. Friends, pray for Washington. Washington, D.C. needs your prayers. Washington, D.C., this is where God has planted me. This is where he's called me. This is the mission field and the shadow of the nation's capital, the home of politics. Politics from two Greek words, by the way, poly meaning many and ticks meaning bloodsuckers. That's what they, <laughs> that's what's happening there in Washington. So let me pray, and we'll get on with uh, what the Lord's laid on my heart this morning. It's, it's a privilege to be here. Father, we just thank you for your goodness and your grace. I pray, God, that you would visit us in a very personal and special way, and that you would uh, help me, Lord, now, as we look into your word, as we give thanks and praise to you for being the God of the universe who loves us so much that you would stoop down from heaven to rescue us. We love you, and we praise you together. And it's in Jesus' matchless name that we pray, and everybody said, amen. amen. I heard the story about uh, an elderly couple. His name was Bill, and her name was Blanche. And uh, every year, they would go to the state fair. And Bill always wanted to take the helicopter ride at the state fair, but Blanche was pretty frugal. And she'd say to him, Bill, come on, it's 50 bucks, and 50 bucks is 50 bucks. And so he wouldn't go on the helicopter ride. Year after year, he would say, Blanche, come on, let's go on the helicopter ride. She said, Bill, I'd love to, but come on, it's 50 bucks. And 50 bucks is 50 bucks. And so this went on year after year. Finally, Bill said, Blanche, listen, we're here at the state fair again. I don't know how many more state fairs I'm going to see. I'm getting up there in age. Let's go on the helicopter ride. Well, as they're fussing about this, the pilot of the helicopter overheard the conversation. And he said, listen, I couldn't help but overhear the conversation. I'm going to make a deal with you all. I'll take you up in my helicopter for free so long as when you sit in the back seat, you don't say a word. Not a word. If you even make a peep, then I'm going to charge you the 50 bucks. But if you don't say anything, the ride's on me. Well, Blanche couldn't refuse that. What a good deal. So up in the helicopter, Bill and Blanche went sitting in the back seat. Well, that that pilot did everything he could to get him to say something. He wanted his $50, right? So he's, he's taking that helicopter up fast as he can, dropping it as fast as he can. He's banking it to the left and banking it to the right. He's doing all these different maneuvers. Not a word, not a word from the back seat. Finally, they land, and the pilot turns around to Bill and says, Mr., I got to give it to you. I did everything I could to get you to say something, but you didn't say a word, so the ride's on me. And Bill said, well, I got to be honest with you, I almost said something when Blanche fell out of the helicopter. <laughs> but 50 bucks is 50 bucks. <laughs> That's a terrible joke, isn't it? That's terrible. 
But it illustrates a question. And here's the question. What determines the value or worth of something? 50 bucks is 50 bucks. But what determines the value or the worth of something? Now, I, I got a C in economics from the late Dr. Walter Williams, so I might be oversimplifying this answer. But one of the things that really determines the value or worth of something is what someone is willing to pay for it. You know, right now in my area and in many places around the country, the real estate market is on fire, just to illustrate this. And it's a seller's market right now. You can put a house up for sale and get just about whatever you want for it. In fact, there's a bidding war where people will fight for the higher price to try to buy a home. I got a friend I'm trying to hire from out of state and he says to me, every time I put a contract on a house in Loudoun County where I'm from, I get outbid, and listen to this, sometimes a hundred to $200,000 more than the asking price on the house. And so what determines the value is what someone is willing to pay for it. Now let me ask you a very important question. If Jesus died on a cross for your sins and he paid the price by the shedding of his own blood, what does that say to you about your value and your worth to God? He paid the supreme price. He died on a cross and sacrificed his life for you because of his love for you. What does that say about your value and your worth in the eyes of God? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, you are not your own, you were bought at a price. You were bought at a price. And then Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, he tells us what that price was. He says, it was not with perishable things like silver or gold, which you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers. Listen, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without spot or blemish. Jesus shed his blood as the price to purchase you. That's how valuable and that's how much you have worth in his eyes. And why is this important for every single one of us to understand? Because you have an enemy of your souls. Satan has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, but I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus is the author of life. Satan is the destroyer of life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Satan is the, a liar and the father of lies. And some of you, I'm convinced, because this is the burden that God's put on my heart for you today, some of you are believing the lies of the enemy because he's trying to destroy you. He's trying to destroy you. And he will work in whatever way he can to discourage you in order to destroy you. And he will whisper lie after lie after lie. Let me tell you why this is particularly important for your age group. When the COVID pandemic was at its worst, the CDC put out reports that your age demographic between 18 and 24 were hit the hardest, not physically, but emotionally and mentally. CDC put this report out last year, quote, U.S. adults reported considerably elevated adverse mental health conditions associated with COVID-19. Younger adults were among those who reported having experienced disproportionately worse mental health outcomes, increased substance abuse, and elevated suicidal ideation, end quote. The CDC went on to report that three out of four Three out of four young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 have struggled in the last year with substance abuse and or at least one mental health issue such as anxiety, depression, trauma, or stress disorders. And so as we're trying to climb our way out of this, out of this thing, out of this pandemic, your age bracket especially needs to know, and if you forget everything else today, listen to these two things. Your worth in Jesus and the hope that you have in Jesus. You need to know this. It is critical for you to understand this. Now in Psalm chapter eight, David writes about the majesty of God. Psalm eight is only nine verses and he begins verse one the same way he ends the Psalm in verse nine. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name 
in all the earth. Now, for you Bible st uh, students, you know that in that verse, O oh Lord, our Lord, the first use of the word Lord is in all caps in your Bibles because it's the proper name of God. In Hebrew, it is Yahweh. Yahweh is derived from a Hebrew verb to be, and it literally can translate the self-existent one. Yahweh means the one who is and was and always shall be. God first revealed his proper name, if you remember the story, right, to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses was assigned the task of delivering the Hebrew slaves out of Egypt back to the promised land, Moses said to God in this conversation of the burning bush, who shall I say has sent me when they ask? They're going to ask. They're going to ask. And what's the answer? And from the burning bush, God said to him, you tell them that I am has sent you to them. Well, that clears it up, doesn't it, now? I am, well, it's that verb to be, I am the self-existent one. I am the one who is and was and always shall be. So, O oh Lord, our Lord. Now, the second use of the word Lord in verse 1 of Psalm 8 is capital L, lowercase o-r-d, it is Hebrew Adonai, and it means Lord or Master, it's a title. The first use is God's proper name, the second use is a title for God. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. God's name is holy. God's name is to be revered. Even as Jesus taught in the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your name is to be revered. I tell people all the time, listen, stop taking God's name in vain. There's kind of a commandment about it, right? It's commandment number three. Don't take God's name in vain. Don't misuse it. Don't, don't get mad and start using God's name because God's name is holy. We are to revere the name of God. I say to people, listen, if you, if you must, when you get angry, just use the name of some, somebody in false religion. Just, you know, just use another name. Just don't use God's name. You, somebody cuts you off in traffic and ticks you off, just that sweet Dalai Lama. Just, you know, go ahead, just... Just, you know, use a false name. Don't use God's name. Dr. Heinsohn gives you a bad grade in your, in your class. Just, just say freaking Buddha, you know, but don't. <laughs> Go ahead, you know, let it rip. It's, they're false gods. Just don't use the name of the true and living God. Why? Because the name speaks to character and honor. And we're never to dishonor God's character and God's name. It's the reason why, it's the reason why, and you'll find this out when you have kids, that when a couple starts to have kids, you, you search every, you know, name because you want the name properly to give to your child, right? And so, you know, you think about what's that name? And you eliminate names, you know, my wife and I, we eliminated former boyfriend and girlfriend names, right? We're not going to have that around the house. Uh, you, you eliminate people that wronged you. You don't want to have that around your house. And then you finally come up with names. Now, I got to be honest with you. There are people in my church, super spiritual Super spiritual. They named all their kids like a walking gospel family. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Mary, and Martha. Well, that's precious, isn't that? I got to be honest, my wife and I weren't that spiritual. We gave our kids uh, Bible middle names, but we just named our kids what was popular at the time. So we had Tyler, Austin, and Lindsay. We just, we just liked those names, Tyler, Austin, and Lindsay. And little did we know, aside from the name Austin, they're all... They're all cities in Texas. You got Tyler, Texas, Lindsay, Texas, Austin, Texas, right? Yeah, okay, well, okay, quiet. Uh, because, uh, yeah, because people were coming up to me going, are you, you all Texas, you all cowboy fans? You cowboy fans? Are you? Sweet Dalai Lama, you gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. All right, listen to me. There's two, there's, there's two things we're gonna find in hell, cats and cowboy fans. I'm just telling you right now. It's it, it's it. It's in the Bible. It's in the Message Bible. It's in the Message Bible, second, the book of Second Opinions. I'm telling you what. That's what we're going to find there. I pastor in Washington, D.C. I've always been a lifelong fan of the no-name team. You know what I'm saying to you? Anyway, anyway, I digress. A name is important. And so David starts out there honoring God's name. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. In other words, there is no place in the planet where your majesty does not extend. 
And then David spends a little bit of time talking about the planet because further in verse three, he says this, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. He doesn't take time to contemplate the entire universe. It's just overwhelming enough, as David writes that, to talk about the moon and the stars that you have hung in place. This much we now know about the moon, for example. It's 240,000 miles from the earth. The moon continually orbits the earth with clockwork precision, traveling around the earth at 2,288 miles per hour. It, competes, it completes its journey around the earth at about 30 days, which is where we get the calendar designation of a month. And if the moon were just a few degrees off, the world would be flooded with unrestrained tides. Here's a little bit of what we know concerning stars. After the sun, the next closest star is 25 trillion miles away. There are an estimated 100 billion stars just in our Milky Way. In the 1990s, we thought that there were only 3,000 galaxies. But today, because of the Hubble Space Telescope and more sophisticated instrumentation, we now estimate that there are, listen to this, not 3,000 galaxies, 10 trillion galaxies each with 100 billion stars. Do the math. That's one with 24 zeros after it. And what is so amazing is that Psalm 147.4 says that God determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Calls them each by name. In Psalm 19, 1 and 2, it says, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. And so David honors the majesty of God. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Verse three, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. Then he asks this very poignant question in verse four. It's the only question in the whole chapter, but this is what he asks. He says, what is man that you were mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? In other words, David is saying, when I consider how majestic is your name, when I consider the marvel of creation, when I consider that you, that God, were the one, was the one who hung the moon in space and sprinkled the dark sky with stars too numerous to count, when I consider that God, it is staggering to me that you would care about me. But he does. He cares for every single one of us. He's a personal God who is intimately acquainted with every single one of us. In, in Isaiah 53, 4, it says that Jesus hears our, uh, bears our griefs and carries our sorrows. In Psalm 56, 8, it says God records our tears. Every time you weep, God records your tears, and it says that he bottles them up in heaven. In Matthew 10, 30, it says, God numbers the hairs on, on our head. This is a personal God who is intimately acquainted with every single one of us because he loves us and you were valuable enough to die for. Mahatma Gandhi was wrong when he said, God is that indefinable something that we all feel but which we cannot know. He was wrong because you are known by God and you can know God in a personal way because he is a personal God. I heard this story years ago. In fact, uh, the, the story happened in 1992. Uh, the lady's name was Terry Horton. She was um, uh, a truck driver from Costa Mesa, California. She lived in a, uh, she lived in a trailer and uh, drank a lot of beer and smoked a lot of unfiltered camels. And one day, Terry Horton stumbled into a flea market and saw a painting that she liked, but she bought it as a gag gift for a friend. She paid $5 for it. She got it home to her trailer, but it was too big to even get through the door of her trailer. It was 66 inches by 48 inches. She couldn't get the thing into her house. So she just propped it up against her trailer, and by her own story, she said, we just sat out, and I just was drinking beer, looking at it, and thinking about throwing darts at it. She said, we got to drinking too much beer, I forgot to throw darts at it. So there it was. 
she decided to sell it at a yard sale. She didn't really want it any longer. And so as she put it out for a yard sale, an art teacher came along and she said, I'm not an art expert, but I think what you have here is an original Jackson Pollock painting. And Terry Horton, I won't obviously use the word she said, but she's like, who the bleep is Jackson Pollock? And so she hired a forensic art analyst by the name of Paul Biro. And Biro discovered a partial fingerprint on the back of the canvas. And after his forensic analysis, because there was no signature on the painting, after his forensic analysis of the partial fingerprint and comparing the paint samples with that from the old studio of Jackson Pollock, who, who has since long been dead, Biro concluded that it was, in fact, an original Jackson Pollock painting. The value went from $5 to millions of dollars. In fact, a Saudi investor offered Terry Horton $9 million for the painting. You know what she said? I'm holding out for 50 mil. <laughs> she died in 2019 and never got any money out of it. But my point is this. What determined the value was the fingerprint of the artist. You bear the divine imprint of the artist of the universe. You were created in his image and in his likeness, and you have inestimable worth to him, and so much so that he dies on a cross for your sins. This should give us hope. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? He made us a little lower than the heavenly beings and he crowned us with glory and honor. This is the God of the universe who loves you. Jeremiah could relate to some times of bitterness and loneliness and discouragement in his own life. You read his story. In Lamentations chapter three, he would pen these famous words. He said, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God is faithful to us. And there's a fresh dose of his compassion and his mercy with every new day. And that's why Jeremiah said, therefore I have hope. Because despite my own downcast situation, I can recall and dwell on the faithfulness of God. And therefore I have hope. You know, hope is a very tricky thing. There was an experiment that tried to measure hope. It was a kind of a famous experiment in 1957. It was conducted by Dr. Kurt Richter of Johns Hopkins University. And uh, I'm going I'm to tell you what the experiment was. Don't send me any emails. It did involve the death of laboratory rats. Okay, don't send me. I'm totally on board with PETA. Okay, I am. Pe people eating tasty animals. I am. But, I, I, uh, but, but, listen, but, but this is how the experiment went. So it sounds a little cruel, just send your emails to Pastor Jonathan. But anyway, uh, here's what he did. He took laboratory rats and he put them in glass cylinders that were open at the top but filled with water. And he dropped rats into these cylinders. And he watched to see how long they would tread water until they died. On average, 16 minutes. 16 minutes and then the laboratory rats would die. So he took more rats introduced them into the same condition, but this time at the 16-minute interval, Dr. Richter took out the rats, dried them off, and fed them, and then reintroduced them to the same climate. And this time, they didn't swim for 16 minutes, not even 16 hours. They swam for three full days. Why? Because hope was introduced to them. If that is what happens when rats have hope, how much more can you and I have the hope that comes from above? Amen? 
David would write, as we sang earlier in Psalm 62, verse 5, find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from Him. The word hope in the Hebrew is tikva, and it literally means rope or cord. In other words, when you think about the hope that you have in the Lord, He's like a lifeline. He's like a rope or a cord that you can hold on to when everything else is falling apart because that's the kind of hope that God delivers for those whom He loves and, again, loves so much that He would die to rescue you. Therefore, as the hymn says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. I want you to know as we pray that you have inestimable worth to your Creator whose fingerprint is upon you and that your hope is in the Lord. Don't you believe the lies of the enemy? God loves you so much that he shed his blood for you. The value and worth that you have in the eyes of your creator is without measure. That's why he died for you. Now put your hope in him. I'm gonna pray for you today, for those of you especially who are struggling right now with some discouragement, maybe some kind of type of depression even. Maybe your heart is downcast like Jeremiah would write about there in Lamentations chapter three. But just remember that he also said in this I call to mind that it's because of the Lord's great love that we are not consumed. He's full of compassion for you. Every morning there's a fresh batch of his compassion and mercy. Great is his faithfulness. Lord, you know those here today who are struggling and just need to be reminded from your word that the God who created the universe and hung the moon in outer space and sprinkled the night sky with stars, that God cares about every single person here. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have hung in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? the son of man that you care for him, but you do. And I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would minister your grace to every single person here, especially who is struggling to understand their worth in Jesus, who needs to know the hope that they have in Jesus. Lord, would you visit them today, please? Would you remind them how precious they are, so much so that you died for them? Would you speak truth to them, Lord, instead of the lies that sometimes we hear when the enemy whispers to us things that aren't true. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the author of life and the giver of life, and you have come that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And we thank you for the cross, your sacrifice, your blood that was shed, the price that was paid. We are not our own. We were bought at a price, and therefore we honor you, Lord, and we praise you. Visit us, Lord, today. Take away every downcast heart and fill it instead with your mercy and your grace. We love you and we give you all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you all.
this chorus together. And on Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand, all of the ground is sinking sand. Come on, let's sing it out together. And on Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground sinking sand all of the ground is sinking sand hey friends can we thank pastor gary for bringing god's word to us this morning come on Hey, next week, it's going to be great. On Wednesday, we'll have John Acuff with us. Wednesday night for Campus Community, we'll have Pastor Dave Stone. And then next Friday is homecoming. We'll have Liberty Zone alumni Shannon Bream with us. It's going to be a great week. Have a great weekend. You guys are dismissed. <laughs>